Revelation that's disconnected from human life has never interested me. It's always seemed like, what's the point? Like, so you have a nice experience and then you're a jerk the next minute. Like, what's the point? What's the meaning of something like that? And that's part of the fun of it, you know? After you get over the angst of it all, <laughs> it's an amazing adventure, you know, for, for all of us, for all of you, it can be. Whatever your insight is, and you, you know, some of you have had deep experience or deep insight, some of you don't think you have, but everybody in this room has had certain insights in their life, certain little moments of understanding, just a, a little bit deeper understanding than you had the day before. We all have had our own deeper understandings, our own moments of insight, whether they're small or great. And one of the great adventures of a lifetime, because, I, because it's an adventure without end, without limit, without finish line, is the great adventure of, number one, translating those, our deepest experience of being down into human terms. That's important. Not that we always do that, because it's beyond human terms. Spiritual revelation is certainly beyond human terms, but it's, it's important that we also translate it down into human terms, and that we there's this sort of adventure of how, how fully and how clearly can you live that out in your humanity? Right? Because it's no guarantee that any of us will. Right? And so, at, you know, at some point, that seems like a burden, you know, because you've experienced this big gap between what you realized and who you are as a human being. It's always like, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like last week, I was meditating in my room, and gee, I just seemed like a Buddha. And then, you know, I walked out of the room, and my kids wanted me to, whatever they wanted you to do, or whatever, you know. And it's like the whole the Buddha just broke into a million pieces, and you're there, the sort of humbled yet again for the 10,000th time in the last week. <laughs> and there's a point, you know, where noticing that is sort of, you know, filled with, with angst and often a fair amount of judgment and some shame sprinkled in and all these sort of toxic hum human emotions and interpretations that maybe after a little while you realize, like, that's not necessary. That just isn't necessary. Like, you're, you, you still are a human being, too. And you just stop, like, projecting perfection onto that human being and, or thinking that it should be just have every single bit of its act together and should be just a perfect expression of your own deepest insights and you just sort of get off of yourself and relax a little bit and you realize this is an adventure. This is like an, this is an exploration, like how deep can this, can I take this? How embodied can I become? And you're not then angst-ridden about the big gap, you just, you've accepted the damn gap, right? You're like, okay, so there's a gap between what I've realized in my better moments and who I am as a human being in my worst moments, for sure. And, but you realize, like, you can judge that and feel terrible about that, or you can get on with the business of, wow, I wonder how close these two can come. Right? Of, of course, the deeper levels of insight and realization show us that the human and the timeless are, are the same. But it's not, they're not just the same. They're the same and they're different. Like heads and tails of a coin. You know, the human mind always jumps between opposites, right? It's this way or it's that way. It's da, 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 da. Reality seems to always come in these sort of nice par paradoxes, right? Realization shows us that we are both the one in the sense of big O, the one, and we are also the one in terms of a little O, a particular incarnate human being. It's not that we go from one to the other, exclusively from the human to exclusively the timeless. That's <laughs> it's a nice dream, but it doesn't go.
we get the whole package. We get the big one and the small one, and we get the adventure of the, the, the humanity growing into its true nature forever, because there's no limit. Doesn't seem to be a limit. To some people, when I say that, you can see a disappointment in their face. They're like, oh. <laughs> it never ends. You know? <laughs> well, what ends is that angst-ridden, you know, thing. It never ends. That can end. Yes, that can end. That's, that's the good news. That's the good news. You know, with the ego that's sort of waiting for a cosmic finish line. What, however you've defined that cosmic finish line, you know, it's basically it's, it's like I'll be really, really, really conscious so I can fall across the finish line and I don't have to be conscious anymore. <laughs> I'll wake up as long as I can go to sleep when I'm totally liberated. You know? <laughs> so, but when we get over that either that thinking this in, in terms of, you know, goals and all that. Then it becomes, from the human perspective, then it just becomes an exploration. How deeply can I live out my own deepest knowings? How deeply can I do that? And what gets in my way? And am I ready to let go of what's in my way? Am I ready to see through it or work, work it out or do whatever I have to do so that it starts to give more space to my true nature? Not so I can ro go across the finish line. That's the human perspective. But from true nature's perspective, its perspective is like, let's see how embodied I can become. That's a kind of a wild thing. It's, I mean, this is sort of theological language, the way I'll post this, and then I'll open it up for some questions if you have any, but it's a weird thing to think that, you know, the, the, the human being, or lot, not all, but a lot of human beings, especially in spirituality, are looking to sort of become, in some ways, disembodied, right? I want to realize my formless nature, right? And good, you, like, that's a good thing to do, that sort of... Step one in terms of awakening, like, yeah, wake up to that. That's essential. But the funny thing is your formless nature also has its own impulse, and its impulse is towards embodiment. It's trying to get embodied. You're trying to get out, and it's trying to get in. <laughs> That's kind of a weird thing. And I'm not saying that as just like, like theory or... I mean, if you don't experience this, don't take it as truth just because I say it. I, I was surprised to find this out myself. I didn't come upon it as ideas first. I, I was actually really surprised by hanging out in the formless for long enough, and all of a sudden you start to feel this impulse in the formless to be embodied, to literally be informed. Like, I didn't expect that. I did not expect that. I expected it was, it was all one-way thing, like, you know, wake up to the formless. My, my, at least the, my in the terms of the ego's point of view, and then when I bumped into the formless's point of view, it's like, oh, it has the corollary equal and opposite. It's trying to get in. It's, it's looking to be informed and embodied. And both of these are equally as important. You know, most people are kind of a little biased one way or the other, right? Um, and both of them are worthy revelations. I mean, we don't have any encompassing experience of our true nature without both, seeing both of these domains, but it's part of that paradoxical nature of reality. It's, it's just what it does. <laughs> 